In this video, we are going to work out an example of the multi-level feedback queue scheduling algorithm. As we have discussed earlier, in this algorithm, separate queues are maintained for processes of different priorities and the process can go from one queue to another. So the first queue might have the processes with the highest priority and if they are not able to complete their CPU burst during in this ready queue when they are scheduled then they can be moved to a lower priority queue and so on. Also if we are assuming in this case that no process in a lower priority queue can run till there is a process in a high priority queue. So only when the high priority queue processes are complete then only the scheduler will schedule a process in the low priority queue. So here we are assuming that there are three queues. The first queue, let's call it Q1, it's following the round robin scheduling with a time quantum of 8. The second queue, let's call it Q2, is again maintaining a round robin scheduling algorithm with a time quantum of 16 time units and there is a third ready queue q3 which is following the first come first serve scheduling algorithm so here is an example where there are three processes p1 p2 p3 their arrival times are given over here 0 16 and 20 and the burst times are 36 20 and 12 time units respectively now we see that at time 0 there is one process P1 which is arriving in the system. So it will be placed in the this ready queue, Q1. So Q1 we see that P1 has arrived. Since there is no other process in the system currently, there is only one process. So P1 will be scheduled. So this is in Q, Q1 and it will be scheduled for 8 time quantum because the round robin algorithm is having a time slice of 8 time units over here. So this, this process P1 will run for 8 time units. Now at 8, again the scheduler checks if there is any other process in the system, but there is none. We are still having P1, but now what has happened since P1 has finished its 8 time units in Q1, now it will be moved into the second ready queue Q2. So once it has completed its time quantum over here, it will be moved into the Q2 ready queue. Now the scheduler when it checks, it sees that there is no process in the high priority queue which is Q1. So now Q2 process is being scheduled and there is only one process over there which is P1. Here the time quantum is 16. So if not preempted then P1 can run for 16 time units. So when P1 starts running we see that at 16 where P1 has just run for 8 time units in the Q, Q2 at 16 a process P2 arrives and now this P2 will also arrive in the high priority queue which is Q1. Since P2 is in the high priority queue, now P1 will be preempted and the scheduler will, be give, will give the processor to P2. So P2 will start running and P2 will run for 8 time units. Now till this time P1 has already run for 16 time units so its time that is left is 20. Now P2 runs for 8 time units till 24 so the time that is left now is 12. At 20 another process P3 has also arrived in Q1. Once P2 has finished its burst in Q1, now it is being sent to Q2. At 20, Q3 had arrived, sorry, process P3 had arrived. 
but P2 was not preempted because P2 was also in the same queue Q1. So it was running and P3 was kept in the ready queue over here. Once P2 has finished its time quantum in the Q1 queue, now it is being sent to the Q2 ready queue. Now if we see there are two processes in Q2, P1 and P2, but one process in Q1 which is P3. Since Q1 is high priority, now P3 will be scheduled in Q1. See, while there are different ready queues, but the Gantt chart remains the same. Gantt chart will be only one because we are assuming just a single processor over here. So this Gantt chart, it is showing the CPU utilization. So since there is only one processor, there will be only one Gantt chart which will show how the processes from different queues are running. So now P3, because it's running in Q1, the time unit is eight units only. So again, it will run for eight time units and now it will run till 32. So if it has run for eight, so only four time units are left for P3 and P3 will also move into the next level of the queue which is Q2. Now if we see we have three processes in Q2 P1, P2 and P3 and no other process is present there in Q1. So now considering the round robin now process P1 which is at the head of the queue now this will be scheduled so P1 will start running. We know that in Q2 the time quantum is 16. So P1 will run for 16 time units till 48. So here Q2 processes are being scheduled now. P1 is running and it is running for 16 time units. Once it has run for 16 time units, that means only 4 time units are left. And now it will be moved to the third level of the queue. And now P1 will come in Q, Q3. Now the next process in Q2 is P2. P2 will be given a higher priority than P1 because in the it is in the high priority queue which is Q2. So P2 will run now and the time quantum is 16 but the time that is left for P2 is only 12. So P2 will run for 12 time units from 48 to 60 and now P2 will complete, so it is out of the system now. So P2 is out of the system since it has completed its CPU burst. Now P3 will be given the CPU. So since the burst of P3, only four time units were remaining. So it will run for four time units and now it will complete its CPU burst and it is also out of the system. Now only one process is left, which is in the Q, Q3. So now the scheduler will give the process processor to this process P1. Since it requires the CPU only for four time units now, it will run from 64 to 68. So this is the Gantt chart. And as you have seen that though there are three different ready queues, but the Gantt chart is only one because there is only one processor. So as we saw, this is the Gantt chart that we have prepared. Now let us see what is the waiting time. For P1, it arrived at zero and it immediately got the processor and it ran till 16. After that, it had to wait from 16 to 32. So there was a wait time of 16 time units. And then again, it had to wait from 48 to 64. So the total wait time for this process P1 was 32. Similarly, we can see for P2. We see that P2 arrived at 16 and it was given the processor also at 16. Then it ran from 16 to 24 and then it had to wait from 24 to 48. 
and it completed its CPU burst over here. So its wait time was 24 time units. Now if we see for P3, then P3 arrived in the system at 20, but it was given the processor at 24. So there was a wait of 4 time units over here. And then after that, this process had to wait from 60 to 32. So the total wait time for process P3 is 32. If we compute the average waiting time, so we add the wait times of all these processes and divide it by the number of processes. So we come out, this comes out to be 29.33.